Hello and welcome to Story of Christianity Week 1. Today we're going to be looking at the early church from after the time of the Apostles up till about 300. It should be understood that this time in the church's history is slightly murky and unclear. We don't have a ton of sources from the first century other than the New Testament itself, and so some of this has to be pieced together. One of the challenges with church history is that one's perspective always comes in. You will notice if you read scholars about this period, there is a lot of reconstruction going, and a lot of pieces of the puzzle must be supplied from elsewhere. And so you'll see confessional uh, distinctives coming through. A Roman Catholic theologian might have very different understandings of how the early church developed that accentuates the claims of the Catholic Church, while a secular scholar who wants to see nothing other than human agency occurring in history might see a cacophony of chaos with no order at all, while what we come to see as Christian orthodoxy appears to be nothing more than power politics. However, we will not be coming from this perspective, assuming that there is actually truth to be found in the Christian scriptures, and there is actually false teaching as well as the truth of the gospel, we'll see that the church has to go through many trials, <clears throat> both internally and externally, to keep forth the um, witness to Jesus Christ and the truth of his gospel. So we're going to see a lot of things today, both the internal challenges of the church and those imposed externally in the first few centuries of her birth. So, just to give you an overview of what we're going to be covering today, we're going to begin with the fall of Jerusalem and the spread of Christianity. The fall of Jerusalem represents the definitive kind of moment in which we can see the early church diverge from its Jewish ancestry. This event marks uh, a fundamental change in Judaism from the Old Testament narratives, and is something we must attend to. We'll then look at the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. How did this happen? What sense can we get of the size of the Christian population at various moments? And how did it spread? What were the means of which it spread throughout the empire and beyond? <clears throat> we'll then be looking at several internal pressures uh, within the church and the means by which the church stabilized as a result. We'll be answering such questions as where does authority come from? How can we tell the true confession of Christ from um, false teaching. So we'll look at the topics of the canon of the New Testament. How does this come about? We'll look at the production of the creeds, um, the earliest creeds, or the rule of faith. And we'll look at the structures of the church, specifically the development of the auspice of bishop. We'll then turn at the second part of this lecture to look at the external pressures, specifically the Roman persecutions and how this challenged the church. What were these about? Why did they come about in the waves that they did? And we'll look briefly at the early church apologists who attempted to give an accounting of the Christian faith both to the Jewish population and to the Greco-Roman world. So before we dive into all of that, though, we need to think through the dynamics of sub-apostolic Christianity. Sub-apostolic means merely after the time of the apostles. So there's much of this dynamic that we already see within the New Testament itself. And I should remind us that there is no thing as an apostolic golden age. While the apostles themselves were inspired by God, their scriptures that they wrote are infallible and tell us the truth of God's um, will for his people, it's not as if the time of the apostles was all rosy. It was a rather confusing time. After Jesus dies and ascends to heaven, we have his apostles going around teaching his messages, um, although it's not as if this is an easy process. The apostles go on their missions. Many of them we lose complete sight of in the historical record. For instance, where does Thaddeus or Bartholomew go? We have some evidence from later church tradition, but much of it is um, unclear. Many of the apostles simply fall out of the historical record, although we can be sure that they were going forth doing the Lord's work. We see the apostles moving to various places, teaching the word of God. However, there is conflict even present within and behind the New Testament. Think, for exa example, of the debate with Paul and Peter at Antioch, in which this debate of how are Gentiles going to be welcomed into this new community is very palpable, and Peter makes the wrong choice. So, while the apostles are giving us the truth of Christ and their writings, which have been preserved by the Holy Spirit, are trustworthy and true, there were errors, there were problems, there were struggles within this early church, there were personality conflicts. This is not that different from the churches you and I go to. These are humans, they are sinful, and yet God has preserved his truth through this fallible institution. <clears throat> 
So we don't only have the apostles going forth, but we have traveling preachers preaching Christ, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. Think about Apollos, who was a learned man who continued to preach the baptism of John until Priscilla and Aquila set him right. And then he would still go forth and teach, and there were conflicts, right? Think of 1 Corinthians. I follow Apollos. No, I follow Paul. No, I follow Christ. Also, 2 John discusses about prophets coming to the church. If they ask for money, he says, ignore them. Do not give them the time of day. So this is a very fluid situation, and we often like to think of it um, <clears throat> very simply, as if the early church was perfect, and if we could just get back to that, um, everything would be fine. But the church has always struggled and always had difficulties. And so as we see the church moving beyond the time of the apostles after they have passed, we shouldn't really expect anything different. It's not as if the churches presided over by the apostles were always faithful, always obedient, or always as quick to live in a Christian way as we are today. So we need to understand that the dynamic scene in the New Testament itself shows a church that is very much a product of the history we experience with struggles, with strife, and yet that does not mean that the Word of God is not overcoming these things and working through fallen people to bring about His truth. We see this, for example, that there are opponents from the very beginning who challenge the truth of God. For instance, you can think of the Colossian heresy, in which some people in the Colossian church are worshiping and bowing down to angels. We also see this in the letters to the churches in Revelation. Some are lukewarm. Some have followed after false teachings. We see uh, corruption of attempted corruptions of leadership as early as Acts 8, as Simon Magus sees the wonderful things that the apostles are doing and says, what can I pay you to get some of that? That's always going to be a struggle. As the church has power, as the church has authority, there will be those who seek to corrupt it. The churches themselves can be very dysfunctional and disobedient. Think of Paul's engagement with the Corinthian church. You can often rejoice that your church is not as messed up as the Corinthian church. Think of the Galatians and their substitution of works for the true gospel. All of this is to say, when we think about the early church, we don't want to think of this as Edenic. There was only one Eden, and it was not the churches of the first century. The apostles were there. They were the emissaries of Christ. They preached the truth of God's word. And we have got that from them in the New Testament, which has been guarded by the Holy Spirit and teaches us the truth of the faith. But that does not mean that on the ground everything was rosy. And many of these struggles, many of these internal opponents, many of this church dysfunction, many of this corruptions of leadership and struggles in and out, um, will be seen throughout the entirety of church history. So, just to frame our mind there, from the beginning, the church has always struggled over order, over faithfulness, and over how to move forward in this world. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So, the apostles go forth from Christ. They write parts of the New Testament progressively throughout the first century, probably from about 45 AD to 90. There's debates on that. I'd uh, have you look at the work of Michael Kruger if you're more interested in those dynamics. We'll talk a bit more about the formation of the canon in a bit. But the first major event of the first century we need to wrestle with is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So the Romans had taken over Jerusalem roughly 60 BCE as the general Pompey came in to the Judean area and the Jews struck a deal coming up against the faces of the Roman legions, which were renowned for their brutality and formidableness, um, the Jews struck a deal that they would come under Roman rule, but they would reserve their right to pray to their God and not partake of Roman worship. However, this situation was always very tenuous, and throughout the first century there were numerous revolts against Roman authorities. We see some of this tension present in the Gospels themselves, with factions such as the Zealots calling for the overthrow of the Roman government. These things come to a head <clears throat> in what is called the Jewish Revolt from 63 to 73 AD. This begins in the area of Caesarea, in which after a judicial judgment in favor of a Jewish plaintiff, there is a riot and um, many Jews are killed. There's a debate amongst the Jewish community, how do we respond to this? And ultimately, those calling for armed rebellion finally are heard, and the Jews take up arms against their Roman oppressors. This war rages for many years, and it's quite a struggle. 
but it culminates in 70 AD. One of the generals who was leading the attack against the Jewish forces was Vespasian. He was renowned for his military victories and for his, the loyalty of his troops. In 68 AD, he is actually called back to, um, to Rome because the Emperor Nero has just died and Vespasian is one of the men vying for the throne. He will ultimately succeed. He leaves behind his son, Tacitus, I'm sorry, uh, Titus, and Titus, who will become the next Roman Emperor himself, surrounds the city of Jerusalem in the spring of 70 AD. By that September, he is able to overcome the city and he sets it all aflame, destroying the Jewish temple and all inhabitants of the city. This scene is very uh, poignantly put forth by Josephus, a former Jewish general who has defected to Rome and sees Roman defeat of Judaism as a sign of God's favor upon them. If we see, we can hear how he describes the destruction of the temple. He says, While the temple was ablaze, the attackers plundered it, and countless people who were caught by them were slaughtered. There was no pity for age, and no regard was accorded rank. Children and old men, laymen and priests alike were butchered. Every class was pursued and crushed in the grips of war, whether they cried out for mercy or offered resistance. The Temple Mount, everywhere enveloped in flames, seemed to be boiling over from its base. Yet the blood seemed more abundant than the flames and the number of the slain greater than those of the slayers. The soldiers climbed over heaps of bodies as they chased the fugitives. This was the scene in 70 AD, as the great second temple that had been built by Herod the Great is no more. This would not mark the end of the Jewish rebellion, which would last three more years until the final stand at Masada. But this would mark the last real effort of the Jewish rebellion. Most Jews were, ex, um, were exiled from the Jerusalem area, and with the destruction of the temple came the cessation of sacrifices, one of the central ideas of Second Temple Judaism. This would bring a definitive shift in much of Jewish practice and the relationship to Christians. We need to see that Judaism of the Old Testament and what would come to be known as Rabbinic Judaism were something very different. The main uh, distinction being without a temple as the focus of cultic practice and sacrifice, the Rabbinic tradition switched to Torah, or the study of scripture, as an offering of sacrifice to God. This will also go as the Jewish people are spread throughout the known world. For the Christian church, this marks the kind of final breaking away from the Jewish faith. This doesn't mean they reject the Old Testament, which we'll talk about in a moment. It means that what was initially primarily a Jewish movement, those who came to see Christ as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, after the fall of Jerusalem, takes a much more Gentile focus. The central um, focal point of Jewish religion was no more. And this has the effect of turning the church outward, focusing much more on living out this faith amongst the Gentiles. This does not mean that they left their Jewish roots behind, but the destruction of the temple, in some ways, marks the definitive break between Judaism and what will become Christianity. With these new challenges, the church had many questions it needed to answer. So let's turn to those as we move forward. With the deceasing, with, with the deceasing, with the death of the apostles, the church had many issues it needed to address. How would the church organize its worship? What would be the secure source of its authority? How would they evangelize and move through the Greco-Roman world? And how would they ward off false doctrine? All of these elements are touched on in the New Testament, but as the church spreads, as the church grows, it must address them more clearly and more fully. I want to begin by looking at the first question, early Christian worship. The center of the Christian faith is the worship of Jesus Christ as the Son of God along with the Father and the Spirit, and it was this that set them apart from the Judaism as the, of their day. It was not just that Christ was Messiah, although he certainly was. It was that he was to be worshipped alongside God the Father and the Spirit as the creator, sustainer, and judge of the world. This, in fact, was a radical thing. We see the earliest Christians worshipping Christ as God in the New Testament itself. Think especially of a Philippians 2 in the Christ hymn. 
At the end, it is said that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. What? That the name of Jesus is Lord. If we know our Old Testament, that's quoting from Isaiah 45. And the name that is to be confessed by all in Isaiah is not Christ, but it is Yahweh himself. So we see this clear effort in the New Testament, especially uh, in Philippians 2, but many other places where Christ is worshipped as God. We see this also in Revelation 5, where he's given the praise of all creation. What this means for our understanding is that the concrete act of worshiping Christ as God precedes the formal theological reflections upon that worship. Okay. So, after Christ rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, and his apostles go forth preaching his message, they worship him. Now, think about how radical this is for a monotheistic Jew. Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. This is the central confession of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the first commandment. Worship the Lord your God alone. And yet, these faithful Jews, who walked the roads of Nazareth and Jerusalem with the man Jesus, came to worship him alongside Yahweh, in fact, calling him Yahweh. This is a radical thing. It took time for the church to reflect, how can we do this? We worship Christ as God because we believe he is God. How does that work? So, we need to understand that the concrete action of worship, this reflection and response to the act of Christ, actually precedes the, con the, the more abstract reflection on why this could be. Some theologians have said that the early church worshipped like Trinitarians, but yet still thought like simple mon uh, monotheists. I think it's a little more complex than that, but we must understand the order here. The praise and worship and prayer and adoration of Christ as divine precedes the theological reflection upon it because it's stemming out of the concrete experience of knowing Christ. This isn't just coming from the New Testament. Uh, many scholars of a more secular mind have challenged the idea that Christ was worshipped, that this happened as a much more slow process. But from our earliest records, we see the, the church worshipping Christ as God. Here's one example, one of our earliest examples of evidence of the Christian church outside of Christian scripture, which comes from a man named Pliny the Younger, who was a Roman official in the area of um, Pontus, who wrote a letter back to the Emperor Trajan as he's rounding up Christians to persecute. We'll talk about those persecutions and other parts of his letter later. But this letter dates about 112 AD, and he's explaining what's happening as he's interrogating these two women who have come, uh, who have been accused of, to him of being Christians. And in doing so, he explains what they say their faith is about and what Christians do. He says, they, the Christians, asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by an oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or idolatry, not falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. Okay, this comes from his interrogation of two Christian women who were possibly deaconesses in 1011 AD. He sent the letter later that year. What can we make of all this? So, one, this is a unique sort of historical source. It's incidental. Pliny had nothing... Um, he had no stake in this game. He's reporting to the emperor the odd behaviors of this random sect from Judea um, who he's trying to get rid of. He's not too happy about it, but he does give us a window into how the early church worshipped. Notice that they're coming together on a fixed day. That would be Sunday, the Lord's Day. And they are singing hymns to Christ as to a God. So Christ himself is the focus of this worship. We also see that in this earliest period, they come together again to partake of food. Notice he says, but ordinary and innocent food. Now, why would he say that? Why would he go to the lengths of saying that? What's going on here is one of the things that early Christians were um, accused of, which we'll talk about again when we look at persecutions, was of vampirism and cannibalism. This is because they were said to come together and eat the body and blood of a man. 
Now you might think, how could you take that from the Lord's Supper? But the, the pagan church did not, or the, the pagan culture didn't know what the church was talking about. And so Pliny makes the point of asking them, what is this food you're eating? Are you dining on human flesh? Are you drinking human blood? So from this very beginning, um, not long after the closing of the, old, uh, the New Testament, we see the church assembling on Sundays to worship Christ and to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, beyond just this literary evidence, we also have some interesting evidence from Rome. This is a, a piece of graffiti found in Rome, dating roughly early 2nd, maybe 3rd century, called the Alexamenos Graffito. Uh, this is basically what you would get when you uh, go into a bathroom stall and see things carved on the wall. What you have in this image is quite clearly a donkey being crucified, and a man offering up a hand in worship and reverence to this God. And the scroll beneath it says, Alexamenos worships his God. So we see quite clearly two things here. The early church worshipped Christ, worshipped the crucified God, right? And that this was seen as something scandalous and mockable by the culture surrounding it. How could this church claim that their God was put to death on a cross. Quite a remarkable thing. This shows us how the Christian church was set apart from the culture. That despite the fact that their claims that Christ was God and that yes, he was crucified and yet rose again, was so deeply embedded in them that they would never give it up. And that the culture saw this as marks of their insanity, uh, of their ignorance, and of their superstition. And it would be one of the reasons that many in the ancient world would mock and reject Christianity. So we do see that the church worshiped Jesus, that it happened uh, on the first day of the week, that is on the Lord's day, and that they also engaged in the Lord's Supper. We can see this general pattern of the structure of worship in the early church, a commitment to the apostles teaching, prayers through Christ, the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper, and then a life that was communal, that included almsgiving and generosity uh, to the poor. If you look to our left here, we can see roughly what an early church would look like. These were not specially built buildings, but were homes that had been converted over time uh, to function as churches. You would have an assembly hall that uh, people would come in to worship. You had an area for teaching. And then you would have an area specifically for baptisms, um, which would only generally be done once a year at the time of Easter. We know of this structure of worship from such sources as Justin Martyr, this man here, who we'll talk about later. In giving an apology to the Romans about the nature of Christian worship, he says this, And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. And the memoirs of the apostles, or the writings of the prophets, are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray, and, as we before said, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president, in like manner, offers prayer and thanksgiving according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which thanks has been given, and to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. So, although this is still in rather rough form, and it's going to be taking place in um, not custom-built buildings like we have today, but converted homes, we see the basic structure of Christian worship. On Sunday, the scriptures are read, they are preached upon, um, the president here is likely an elder or a pastor, it's a little unclear. Prayers are said to God. The church communally eats bread and wine. The water here is symbolizing the practice of baptism. And there is prayer and thanksgiving offered, ending with amen. And we also see the presence of deacons here caring for those who cannot come to church. Therefore, the first thing we need to know about the Christians is the center of their life was the worship of Jesus and the communal life that flowed out of it that was connected to the apostles' testimony and the sacrament. This was the heartbeat of the early church, and it would be the central feature that would be spread throughout the ancient world. All right, let's begin then to talk about 
how did Christianity spread throughout the Greco-Roman world? As you might know from the New Testament, Christianity initially spread primarily through the Jewish synagogues. Each uh, an apostle would generally go to a town, begin preaching to the Jews. He might have some success there. We see this pattern in Paul. And then would turn outward to the Gentiles to welcome them into the church. What we need to understand, and sometimes it's hard to uh, remember this, that the church grew rather slowly and began as a very small group. If you think back to Acts, there are probably only a few thousand people following after Jesus by the 50s or 60s. And according to Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity, by 150 AD, there were likely no more than 40,000 Christians in the entire Roman Empire, 10,000 of which were in Rome itself. That is, out of the 60 million inhabitants of the Roman Empire, less than one hundredth of one percent. This is 120 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So things were happening at a rather slow rate. This is a small, small minority faith that is struggling in some ways at the margins of society while also being persecuted at periodic times. But it is gaining speed, especially in Rome, as we see 10,000 Christians. And so how does this religion spread? Where are its early uh, areas of influence and where does it go from there? So I want us to look at this map of the Roman Empire and see where the church began. This map is from slightly later than the early period, but if you notice, we begin here in the Levant, around the place of Jerusalem. We see early communities develop in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, especially around Rome. And then later through the centuries, there are large portions in Carthage, in uh, what is now present-day Tunisia, growing into Gaul, or present-day France, and especially in Egypt, which will be an important center of early Christian intellectual thought. Beyond just the Roman Empire, we must stress, Christianity also spread to the east, into the Persian Empire, and had great success there. It spread south into the area of Ethiopia, where its foundation was probably as early as the first century, and as well as being spread to India. Uh, legend initially attributed this to the Apostle Thomas, where the Christians there would trace their um, early foundation to. Uh, later scholarship has confirmed this, that there is a Christian community that has existed in India, most likely since the first century, and possibly from the Apostle Thomas himself. So, this was a small game. They would use the trade routes. They would go to places where Jewish communities were, because they were more likely to be familiar with the scriptures and they would begin to preach the message of Christ. However, this spread did take a while. If we look here, we'll see the, um, the slow development and growth of the Christian church. If in 15, uh, 150 AD, I'm using AE and CE synonymously here, we see a very small portion. About 50 years later, that has moved by five times to about 220,000. We see a big shift in the third century. From 200 to 300, we've moved from a tiny percent of the population to 10%. And that's partially through the um, hard work of evangelization and the church being seen as, um, as standing up very well against persecution that pulls other people in. The massive shift we've seen between 300 and 350 is a largely a result of the legalization of Christianity under Constantine, which we'll talk about more in the next lecture. Okay, so we have a church that has been spreading. It is still quite small. A church this small is liable to many factors and disagreements and unfaithfulness and other parties. This movement is so small that the message of Christ could easily be hijacked for something else. And therefore, it needs something to stabilize it. What is the authority? What are the mechanisms? What are the sources that can keep this church true to its original intent, the message of the salvific work of Christ? So we're going to move on then and look at three forces of stabilization. The canon, the creed, and the bishops, okay? each of which we'll look at in turn. So let's begin with the canon of scripture. You've probably all heard this term. Canon comes initially from a word that means standard or rule of authority. 
Its initial meaning is merely a rule or, or a ruler. What can, by what can we measure the truth of anyone's claim about God or Christ? The earliest Christians, Scripture meant the Old Testament, which was seen as the authoritative revelation of the Creator. Later, 27 books of the NT Canon developed. However, this was an organic process over the first two centuries, in which there was some debate over um, certain edge cases, such as the book of Revelation, 2 Peter, or the book of Hebrews. But by 100, the four Gospels and Paul's letters were already circulating as collections of Scripture, that is, giving us the divinely inspired truth of God, and they were seen as on par with the Old Testament itself. This process is already going on in the 60s, as we see from Second Peter, in which Paul's letters are described as Scripture, just as the Old Testament. So the canon took a while to develop because we need to account for the organic nature of the New Testament. <coughs> It's not as if the early church had a New Testament like you do today, a nice bound book that is all nicely collected in one easy spot. Remember, many of the New Testament books were letters sent out to churches throughout the empire. Paul would write off a letter to Corinth, he would send it to them through a messenger, and they would copy it and send it to other churches. Um, but there was no unified attempt, really, to collect these all at the end of Paul's life necessarily. These needed to be spread throughout the church, disseminated, collected back together, and then copied again to be spread throughout. Okay, so this process is not as clean as um, we might sometimes think. There were real organic processes going on. The works had to be collected. They had to be um, written again, right? There is no... Um, Xerox machine, there was no printing press. Each of these had to be copied by hand. And then they had to come together, go to all parts of the Christian world, be seen for what they were, which was the truth of God, and then collectively brought together. This process took a few centuries. But this should not worry us. The historical process of canonization uh, is, not, um, is not what we base the truth of these texts on. We trust that they are divinely inspired because they are written by the apostles, attended by the Holy Spirit, and recognized by the church as the speech of our Lord. We'll talk a little bit more of that as we go. One of the things that really forced the canon to become more official was a challenge to it by a man named Marcion. Okay? Marcion was a figure who was teaching in Rome. He lived roughly from 85 to 160 AD. And Marcion came from the idea of pitting the Old Testament God versus the Father of Jesus. He saw the Old Testament God of creation as cruel, as not befitting the moral duties of Jesus. And so he wrote and he cut down the, new, the, the scriptures to fit his understanding of who God was. So he rejected the entirety of the Old Testament, and he held that the New Testament was a single gospel of Luke, with all the Old Testament references cut out, and ten letters of Paul, excluding the pastorals and Hebrews, which um, most early church fathers thought Paul wrote. His canon claimed to be free of the Jewish influences. So we see Marcion doing something that you see a lot, even in the contemporary church, of rejecting the Old Testament and holding up a version of Jesus that is kind of tame and separated from the truth of the Old Testament. This was a severe challenge, and the church needed to respond. Why was it that the Old Testament and Jesus work in perfect harmony? Why was it that we don't just need a single gospel, shorn of Matthew, Mark, and John, but all of them together to see who Jesus is? The person who came comes most uh, clearly forward to answer Marcion is this man, Irenaeus of Leon. Irenaeus was born in Smyrna in Asia Minor in about 140, and he was perhaps a disciple of Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, who was himself a disciple of John the Apostle. Uh, Polycarp will later be martyred in a very famous scene. Eventually, Irenaeus is sent and becomes bishop in the, uh, Gaul in the town of Leon. It is there that he is uh, helping out a church that has experienced um, a bit of persecution, their previous bishop had recently been killed, and he himself will be killed in 202. Irenaeus is important because he sets forth many works against contrary teachings within the early church. 
The most famous is his work Against Heresies, written in 180, or around there, uh, which argues against various Gnostic sects, but also specifically addresses Marcion. We'll look at his uh, rejection of Gnosticism in a moment. Irenaeus argued that God's actions in history are unified. While Marcion sees the separation, the God of the creation doing one sort of thing and the God of redemption doing another, Irenaeus argues for this unified story from creation through fall and redemption, in which the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the prophets, is none other than the God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. And he does this by looking at the uniform action of God throughout the Testaments, the predictions through the prophets, the way in which Christ fulfills them, how he speaks from the Old Testament, how he shows forth the truth of all these things. And in some ways, in another work, Irenaeus bases this on the covenantal purposes of God in the Old Testament that are seen as being fulfilled through the testimony of the apostles and then set forth by the church thereafter. If you're interested in this element of Irenaeus, look at his work on the apostolic preaching that puts this all together. So, Irenaeus gives a theological rationale for rejecting Marcion. No, you cannot separate the New Testament from the Old. The New Testament only has its meaning within our understanding of the covenant mission of Yahweh, the God of creation, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That mission is set forth and only is explicable with Jesus, but likewise Jesus is only explicable within the contours of the Old Testament world. And the, th the disciples had accurately set this forth, unlike Marcion, who had cut and paste what he wanted out of the New Testament and not taking its full responsibility for the message of Christ. Another response to Marcion comes in what is called the Meritorian Canon. This comes about in 170, um, and is a partial refutation. So the initial canon comes from Marcion, which is just Luke and these letters of Paul edited. In response to this, we have this canon set forth that puts forth 22 out of the 27 New Testament books and says, no, this is where the truth is to be found. We cannot edit this out. So this is the first attempt by the church to say, these are the books of the apostles. However, there are some things left out. For instance, there's no mention of the book of Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, or 3 John. Um, some of those choices are rather odd. For instance, if 1 and 2 John are there, 3 John would all seem to belong with it as well, considering they generally um, circulated as a collection well before um, they were recognized amongst the 27. But this shows us a basic principle of canon, that the core, the Gospels, the Pauline letters, and many of the other books were settled from an extremely early time. Um, the end of the first century is pretty clear. Some of the other books that were more standalone, for instance, James does not circulate with anything else right away because it's a standalone letter, took more time to be accepted. They were read in some churches as sacred scriptures, while other churches set them aside or thought they were useful but not necessarily inspired. It would take some time for the church as a whole to recognize the worth of all these books. Um, the first mention we have of all 27 books with no question as to um, their authority comes in a letter by, or sorry, yeah, a letter by Athanasius, who was the Bishop of Alexandria, written in 367. This is previously stated by uh, local councils in North Africa, but Athanasius sets it forth uh, for us quite neatly. In responding to those who are trying to add different books into the reading of the church, Athanasius says this, since some have taken in hand to set in order for themselves the so-called Apocrypha and to mingle them with the God-inspired scriptures concerning which we have attained to a pure, to a sure persuasion according to what the original eyewitness and ministers of the word have delivered unto our fathers. I also, having been urged by true brethren and having investigated the matter from the beginning, have decided to set forth in order the writing that have been put in the canon that have been handed down and confirmed as divine in order that everyone who has been led astray may condemn his seducers, and that everyone who has remained stainless may rejoice, being again reminded of that. So, what is Irenaeus saying here? One, Irenaeus is trying to set this apart, the God-ordained scriptures that come from the original eyewitnesses that have been handed down from the fathers. So therefore, he's invoking apostolic authority. 
We don't believe in these texts because they're just anything, but they are connected to the eyewitnesses and testimony of the apostles themselves. And notice what he says as well. They have been handed down and confirmed as divine. Confirmed as divine. So, what is at stake here? For Athanasius, and this speaks for much of the early church as well, what makes something canon is that it is connected to the truth of the apostolic teaching, either through an apostle himself or one who is extremely connected with the apostle, and that as one reads this book, they are confirmed to be the divine word. So this is a debate is often seen between Catholics and Protestants. How did the canon come about? Certain Catholics, though not, not the ones who are most carefully attuned to the tradition, will say the church creates the canon. And by that they mean that we would not have a canon if we did not have a church to choose it. This is a mistaken idea. The church does not choose the canon, as in the church would pick these books no matter what they were. They could have picked any books. They could have picked a shopping list of Paul and it would have been canon. That's, that's really not how the early church saw it or careful Catholic theologians either. What is going on with the canon is a recognition. Okay? The spirit is working in the church so that they might hear the words of the master. That they read these texts and say, in this we hear God speak. That's what Athanasius means when it is proven as divine. We have to think of the canon in a theological manner. God, who is the Lord of all providence, arranged that these books would be maintained, that they would be copied, that they would be dispersed, that they would be read, and that the church would hear in them the very words of God. For they are God-breathed. And the spirit within them would recognize that and confirm it. This process took some time. And there was mild quibbles over certain books uh, until about the 4th century. But from this earliest time, the 27 books were largely accepted as the scriptures of the church and were kept to be so um, throughout the ages. Okay. So what can we say about the canon of the church? This is an important step for the early church's formation. What books are going to be taken as the truth of God for the church to rely upon. We can say from the earliest church that the inspired scriptures of the Old Testament were accepted by Christians as the final authority to truth, and that the written testimony of the apostles were considered on par with the Old Testament. This took some time to be recognized by the whole church, but it did. Over time, the writings of the New Testament were collected and recognized as authoritative in an organic process that took a while, took roughly two centuries. The deciding factor for the church was that these texts were, one, connected with the apostolic witness, and two, acknowledged to be divinely inspired. While this process might be a little more messy than people might uh, generally assume, the core of the New Testament was acknowledged very early as canon, but certain books took longer to be acknowledged by the whole of the church. I would uh, recommend the work by Michael Kruger on the formation of canon, if you will uh, want to dig into this more. Also notice the typo on that slide. I do apologize. All right, moving from the canon, we also need to then look at the rise of bishops. We've already seen several bishops in this story already, Irenaeus and Athanasius. So how did these bishops arise? So if we begin in the New Testament, we'll see that these two terms, presbyteroi and episkopos, are used interchangeably. Uh, for the same position within a more or less two-office system of elders and deacons. Uh, to look at this, see the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, and Titus, and especially First Peter, where he moves between presbyteros and episkopos in the same sentence with the same referent. However, as the church develops in the second century, these titles begin to differentiate into different roles towards what is called a monoepiscopate, or having one bishop over a city. So how did this occur? How do we move from the New Testament of pastorals, which seem to be very clear of multiple elders in a single church, there is no distinction between an overseer and an elder, to what will become widespread practice in the mid to late uh, second century of having one main bishop over a city with priests underneath. This is a bit of a murky process, and we'll try to uh, uh, shed some light on it as we can. So the first evidence for this shift from a number of elders uh, serving alongside each other to a monoepiscopate comes in the work of Ignatius of Antioch, who was the bishop of Antioch in the late first century. Okay? He was later martyred 
uh, and the account of his martyrdom is quite uh, remarkable. He's primarily known for a series of letters he wrote on the way to be martyred in Rome. Much like Paul, his, he was transported to Rome, and there he was killed for his confession of faith. It is in these works that he comments to the people to submit to their local bishop. He sends out several of these letters. Now, there has been some debate over how to take this, but more or less what he's saying is that submit to the head of the church in your era, your, your area, and listen to them as you would to Christ. Also, Irenaeus, in his battle against the Gnostics, uh, would add to the transition with the idea of apostolic succession. So, Ignatius says, you need to listen to your main bishop. Irenaeus makes this case against the Gnostics, who are spreading all sorts of teachings. Uh, and he's saying, no, the proper path of teaching moves through those who have been appointed by the apostles and those who have been appointed by them, etc., etc. So, we see this need that ordination comes from a specific line. Not anyone can just get ordained to become a priest. There has to be a specific controlled movement of this teaching. Okay? And in this, he was trying to guard from the, uh, from the Gnostics who became self-appointed prophets of Christ. Uh, this might not be all that different from today of most uh, magisterial reform traditions saying that ordination must come from other elders and cannot be a self-appointed thing. However, this will be used by Catholics to make a very different point. So what can be said about this? Uh, there's, there's a lot that could be, I just want to make a couple clear points. The rise of bishops likewise was an organic process that took place at various times and in various places. So to go back to Ignatius, while Ignatius does address bishops in several of the towns, when he writes his letter to Rome, he does not address a bishop. It doesn't seem like there's anyone there. Evidence from the uh, first and second century seems to see, seems to say that certain churches had multiple elders, none of which were supreme, um, and that the bishop might have just been a development of a particularly charismatic, skilled, or um, um, powerful person who kind of rises above the rest. Because we're piecing together various evidences, we must understand that confessional allegiance plays a large part in this. Uh, a Catholic historian will see it very much in a way that supports the Roman understanding of bishops, likewise with an Anglican, um, but and a Presbyterian is going to see it, uh, it their own way, not seeing a real theological case for the bishops, but more of a pragmatic understanding that in, by circumstances developing over time, a single bishop would rise up for the sake of order and stability. So let me tell you what I, how I understand this occurring. So we have to remember a couple things, right? This is a small community, and most churches are going to be anywhere from 20 to 100 people developing in a small city. And as they grow, their leadership structure may also grow. How does this work out? The way I think about it is um, how church plants grow. I've seen this in St. Louis. You get a very charismatic pastor who comes in, he plants a church, it starts small, it gets more and more. You get elders uh, who are selected from that congregation. More and more people come, and what do they do? I think of especially in a time where these were being done in private homes. You're going to need to meet in multiple locations. Think of site plants, right? So then you get multiple sites in which the church is meeting. That initial church planter, although he's technically equal with the other elders, will begin to rise above, right? You might have elders at each site, but then the head pastor is overseeing all of them. Okay, um, This is a pretty organic process that happens by the need of centralized leadership and stability, personal, charisma, uh, personal charisma and skill. And I wouldn't be surprised if something like this happened in the early church, that the main and most skilled leader of a local congregation would be risen up to lead in a local area. However, this happens throughout the church, and the bishops are seen as, in some ways, the most responsible for guarding the teachings and the progression of the church. It should also be noted, though, that all these bishops, through the 4th century, are elected by the people. They are not appointed from above, but they are communally elected from the priests or even from a layperson. So there's a lot of complicated stuff going on in the rise and structure of this early church.
Um, I'd be happy to answer more questions about that when we meet. But before, uh, but let's move on to, we've looked at how the structure of the church developed, how the canon of the church developed. Now let's look at the nature of a creed. So along with securing the scriptures and the structure of the church, early Christians had to clearly define the boundaries of the faith. This was done by what we call the rule of faith, which is expressed in creeds. The word creed comes from the beginning of um, all these works, which means simply credo, I believe. How was the church to set forth truth against all false doctrine? This developed, again, in a rather organic way. I'm sorry to keep saying that, but that's how it occurred. And one of the things that really propelled this was the teaching of a group called the Gnostics. So, who were the Gnostics? Um, again, this is a bit of a complicated issue, but more or less, this was a group of people who claimed to have special knowledge. Gnos Gnostic comes from the word gnosis, meaning knowledge. They had received special knowledge not contained in scriptures, and salvation comes through this knowledge. There were many groups of these people spread throughout the ancient world. Um, Gnostic was in some ways a pan-religious movement. We couldn't see it as just a unique school with unique teachers, um, but was spread throughout very different schools. You would have Gnostic Judaism, Gnostic Christianity, Gnostic Platonism, and kind of straight-up Gnosticism. More or less, this idea was that there is a dualism between matter and spirit that corresponds to good and evil. In the beginning was a unified one. This one, in some sense, bubbles over through tension and turmoil within it, moving down to different aeons, different uh, lesser gods, one of which creates the material world. This demiurge, this creator of the material world, is not good, and what we need is return beyond materiality through, um, through ascendance of light and intellectual contemplation. So these ideas were mixing in with Christianity. And there's two main fronts where they did so. One is cosmology. They saw the cosmos, the world, as divided into two components. The physical or material world, which is inherently flawed and evil, and the spiritual world, which is inherently good. So notice what they're doing here. Christianity clearly talks about a, a fall, right? There is, um, there is sin. There is that which is evil. But it is not material. Although, if you read Paul in the wrong way when he talks about flesh and spirit, which is an ethical category for him, but if you look at it in a Gnostic manner, one might think that the spirit is good and the flesh, the body, is evil. And so Gnostics can pick this up and say, see, Paul is teaching along with us. This then clearly leads to issues with creation. The true God, according to the Gnostics, did not create the world this material existence that we find ourselves in, because materiality is evil. So there's no way the good God of light created this. Creation results from a lesser God, or some other divine being, and is an emanation out of one of these beings. Within certain human beings is a hidden spark, which is one of these divine beings, wisdom or Sophia. This is a complicated tradition, and it has very, very different offshoots. But basically, what Gnosticism says is that the divine broke apart, Part of that divinity created the material world. Many of us are just sparks of divinity that need to be released and returned back to God, shedding this material body. Now, why do we bring up this group and their strange teachings? One, they were very influential in the Christian world, um, and the same world as the Christians. Remember, Christianity is very small. It doesn't take many of these people to begin influencing the church. And they could take themes that appear in the Christian scriptures and say that they support them. So they would cling a lot to the Gospel of John, certain sayings in the letters of Paul, and they would disregard all that resurrection stuff as just a Jewish influence. Okay? So when we look at the canon, when we look at scripture, it's not just the words there, but we have, a, have, have to have a coherent frame to put them together. Somebody could take the scriptures and come up with something entirely different from its message as understood in continuity with the Old Testament. And that's why the early church would talk about something called the rule of faith. You could see this as the controlling story that Christianity is actually telling. Yes, you could go off by yourself and pick apart the Bible and make whatever system you'd like, but that doesn't mean you're getting in line with what it's actually teaching. So therefore, the rule of faith is the unified story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation.
that the God who created the world, who made covenants with Israel, has become incarnate through the Son in the person of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, who has created his church to be his kingdom, to show forth his glory, to preach his message in the world, and that he will come again and redeem and restore this created world at the resurrection. And this creation will be made perfect and good unto him. This is the rule of faith. And the church had to reiterate this. We can't just take parts of the Bible and move them about. We have to hold them together. Once again, Irenaeus becomes very important for us here. Irenaeus devoted his entire book against heresies to refuting Gnostic errors and misinterpretations of Scripture. And he does this by applying the rule of faith, which he claims um, was straight from the apostolic preaching, which he sets forth in his book called On the Apostolic Preaching. So here's what Irenaeus says. This is how he sets forth the rule of faith and what the Gnostics do. He says, They gather their views from other sources than the scriptures. And to use a common proverb, they strive to weave ropes of sand while they endeavor to adapt with an air of probability to their own peculiar assertions the parables of the Lord, the sayings of the prophets, and the words of the apostles, in order that their schemes may not seem altogether without support. In so doing, however, they disregard the order and the connections of the scriptures, and so far as in them lies, dismember and destroy the truth. So here's what Irenaeus is saying. You can't just cherry pick from scripture. You have to understand it as this whole, this story of God's actions in the world. Yes, the Gnostics can come and cherry pick a verse here or there, but they're taking it out of context, and they're making it into something fundamentally different. He uses another analogy in the work of a mosaic of a king. One can look at that mosaic, break it up with a hammer, and re-put, and re-put the little tiles and produce a fox. But that doesn't mean that's what the mosaic was in the first place. And this is what he's claiming the Gnostics are doing. They're taking a different fundamental narrative about existence. Not creation, fall, redemption, consummation, but the desolation of the divine descending into the material world through um, becoming like weighed down by matter and returning up to the divine. You can see how on a very superficial reading these two can seem the same. But they are fundamentally different stories, fundamentally different gods, fundamentally different means of salvation. One affirms creation as good. The other sees it as the problem. (coughs) So, how does the church guard against this? This comes primarily through the early adoption of creeds, or statements of Christian belief. The most uh, popular one, which you're probably familiar with, is that of the Apostles' Creed, which begins, as you know, in the beginning, God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and then I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and then finally the statement of I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So, how does this creed, which you can read more about the history of in Holcomb, um, effectively give stability to the church? We need to notice a couple things here. One, we notice a clear narrative pattern. We begin with creation. We move through the story, the concrete historical story of Jesus Christ, and then to the spirit and the church age. This moves very clearly. Um, the evidence of Christ, or the, the creation, Christ, Pentecost. Okay. We also notice the Trinitarian structure of the creed: Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We also have a clear movement into the future with the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. You might have skipped over that verse, that article of the creed before, but the resurrection of the body was the most shocking and countercultural uh, confession of this creed, other than the divinity of Christ, um, in which nobody disagreed really with eternal life. The soul was seen as eternal by most Greco-Roman philosophers. What they couldn't accept, and you see this in Acts 17 with Paul on Mars Hill, was the fact that the soul would return to the body and that we would live with God as embodied creatures. This was one of the most radical beliefs of the early Christians. All right, so this helps sum us up with the formation in the early church. There were many struggles. There were many opponents. Those who tried to preach a very different message than is understood by the apostles. Those were those who rejected the Old Testament, who rejected matter, who 
rejected the authority of the church. And these early figures, through the processes of canon, creed, and bishop, sought to stabilize this very small community from internal errors and set forth the true teaching of Jesus to the world. Okay, so we've looked at some of the internal struggles of the church. Uh, for the rest of the lecture, I'd like to focus on some of the external struggles and see how the church responded to both persecution and to intellectual challenges that the apologists will meet. So let's begin first with the persecutions of the church. I'm sure you've all heard that the early church was persecuted by the Roman Empire. Now, we don't want to be exclusive here. Rome persecuted the church, but so did the Persians, and so did many other empires. We don't want to exclude this just to Rome. And this was not a continual thing, however. Persecutions were generally local, they were for a short period of time, and they would often pass away. If the church was um, being inconspicuous, there was often no uh, particular desire by the local officials to persecute them. But this persecution begins very early, and we'll go through some of these persecutions as we go. But what is the meaning of these persecutions for the church? We have to see that as Christ was persecuted, as the authorities had him murdered, um, his followers would also suffer. And the early church knew that this suffering would come. However, oddly enough, this persecution did not break the church, but in fact strengthened it, as confessions of faith became one of the ways that non-Christians were drawn into this religion. The courage of the early martyrs, their joy in the face of um, terrible, terrible persecution and facing death was inspiring, and it made the pagan world look and say, what is so different about these people that they can go to death um, rejoicing? It was not as if um, these deaths were not a prominent people. Many bishops and early theologians were martyred for the confession of their faith. And by that confession, they were revered by, um, by their local congregations and given much honor. And by so doing, they helped spread the true theological message of Christ. But it also was not just bishops who were martyred. We see everyday people being martyred for their real confession of faith. For example, Perpetua and Felicity, who are above me at the moment, are great examples. They die in a persecution in the early third century. Perpetua is a young noblewoman um, who is, this is in North Africa, who has recently had a child, and she comes to accept Christ, and she's in her prison cell, and her father is begging her to renounce Christ for the sake of her child, and she refuses. And her, along with her servant, Felicity, uh, go to the lions, hand in hand, confessing Christ and singing hymns to God. Uh, it's a really remarkable story, and we know this because we have a recounting of it uh, from that time. I would recommend, if you were interested, to look up the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity. It's a very moving story. So, what was the policy that Rome was working with here? So, we have to begin back in the first century. So the Jews were excluded from persecution because of the deal they struck with the Roman Empire when they came into it in the in 60s BC. Basically, their deal was they didn't have to pray to the Roman gods or later to the Roman Empire when uh, the emperor when that became a thing, um, but could pray for the emperor. Initially, the Christians were under this same um, same blanket statement because they were seen as just another sect of Judaism. But however, after there was a differentiation between Christianity and Judaism. Uh, they kind of fell out, fell from under the umbrella of protection that was given to the Jews. Now, most emperors didn't seek them out, but it was an outlawed faith. It was outlawed because of its exclusivity. The Romans were very open in their religious practices. You could worship whatever god you want. The main thing was, though, you couldn't deny the existence of the other gods. You couldn't deny worship to the emperor or to the gods of the empire. Because that would be to break the religious framework of the Imperium as a whole. Remember, the Imperium was seen as um, the favor of the gods. And to challenge that, to reject the gods, to go against them, uh, would threaten the communal life of the whole people. And so the Romans would, um, would persecute Christians when they found them, but they weren't always looking for them. So, for instance, going back to Pliny, 
who we looked at earlier in the lecture in 112, he explains his process of what he does when he finds out uh, about Christians. He's writing to the Emperor Trajan, who had ordered him to do something of the like. Pliny says, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christian, Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. Those who denied that they were or had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words dictated by me, offered prayers with incense and wine to, their, to your image, which I had ordered to be brought for this purpose, together with statues of the gods, and moreover, cursed Christ, none of which those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do. These, I thought, should be discharged. So what's Pliny doing here? So Pliny's saying, I don't seek these people out. But if somebody says, my neighbor's a Christian, which might happen because of pettiness or uh, anything like that, the, the Romans often tried to abide by due process, at least with freedmen, um, Pliny would give them a test. Okay, are you a Christian? Okay, you say you're not? Okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to give a little sacrifice to the gods, a little incense, a little wine, and say this prayer. If you do that, you're free to go. Why would this work? In some sense, this was a lie detector test for Christians. Because those who were committed to Christ could not do this. It would violate the very first commandment to offer worship to something other than God. That's why he says at the end, they cannot curse Christ, nor um, can they be forced to give sacrifices to the gods. And so this was what set the Christians apart. Not, um, not that they were doing anything immoral, but that they refused to sacrifice to the gods of Rome and they refused to curse Christ and said that he alone was Lord. This could not be abided by, by Rome. These people are seen as obstinate, troublemakers, and <clears throat> they were spreading their discord throughout the empire. They had to be dealt with. So we're going to briefly go through some of the main persecutions before looking at some of the causes of it. The first Roman persecution begins very early in the 60s under the Emperor Nero. It is in this persecution that Peter and Paul are most likely killed. This happens probably around 16, or 6, 64 to 65. We have evidence from this from the uh, annals of Tacit Tacitus. He says, Nero fastened the guilt and affliction. Uh, sorry, Nero fastened the guilt and afflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. So what happened was in 60 and 64, there was a great fire in Rome. It's unclear why it started, but the fire largely bypassed the Christian quarter of the city. We recall that there was a large Christian population in Rome. Much of the blame for the fire rested on Nero, who was not a very popular emperor, emperor and was uh, thought to be insane at times. And so what he does is he scapes go, scapegoats the Christians. And he says, they are the reason that this fire has come upon us. They refuse to worship the gods. They refuse to give proper sacrifices for them. And because of these unbelievers in our midst, these atheists, because they reject the gods, um, I will sacrifice them, more or less, to the pagan deities. And so it is said that Nero would light his garden parties with Christians covered in pitch. It is this that comes the first massive, first major persecution of Christians, but it quickly does die down. However, the policy of persecutions persists in the early empire as well, under Domitian, Trajan, and Hadrian. It's in this time, in about 112, that we see the letter of Pliny. We also have the martyrdom of Ignatius of Antioch in this period. The sporadic persecution continues throughout the reigns of Antoninus Pius and Marcus Aurelius, so mid-2nd century. It's in this period that we see the martyrdom of Polycarp, who gives an excellent confession to faith and... Uh, is written in an account called the Martyrdom of Polycarp, which I would recommend. And Justin Martyr is also killed, who will be one of the early apologists, and uh, will actually write against these persecutions to the Roman Emperor. So these are all fairly local, low-scale persecutions, although many Christians do die. It is in the 3rd century, however, that things pick up. Okay? In 202, conversion to Christianity is completely outlawed and we have a series of persecutions thereafter. Significant martyrdoms in this period are Perpetua and Felicity, who I'm also mentioned, and this is also a time where the martyrdom of Leon Leonidas, who would be Origen's father, comes in. Origen recounts the tale that, uh, it's, it's debated whether it's true, 
but his father is going off for martyrdom and his mother has to hide his clothes so he doesn't follow him out and also partake of martyrdom. That happened in Alexandria. So these persecutions would generally take place in larger cities or and very sporadically in the countryside if you had a particularly rambunctious um, um, official out there, kind of like Pliny. Many other officials aren't going to be worried about this, but Pliny was rather, um, what would one say, As, uh, assiduous in his duties. Things begin to change, though, in the mid-3rd century. When we get the, the first great persecution under Decius, uh, later ca uh, carried on by Valerian, this is the first empire-wide persecution. Okay. This is, um, there was a failure of battle on the Dacian frontier, so present-day Hungary, Romania area. And Dacia, Dacius blamed the Christians for this failure. And so he decrees that all Christians must give up their scriptures. And he intentionally targets the clergy so that the Christians cannot perpetuate themselves. It's in this persecution that Origen himself is tortured, although he does not die. He becomes what's known as a confessor, one who is tortured for the faith, but is not killed. And the, uh, Cyprian, the bishop of North Africa, also dies. This first persecution is quite brutal, um, but the church holds up fairly well. It will cause some issues, though. What do you do with those Christians who... <clears throat> who do recant, and then after the persecution uh, resides, um, try to return to the church. This would be a struggle in both after the first great persecution and the second. Uh, we'll maybe talk about some of those issues when we get to Augustine later in the course. However, the biggest persecution comes in under the Emperor Diocletian from 303 to 310. While many of these other persecutions were rather short-lived a few years, the second great persecution does the most damage to the church. So what happens is on February 23rd, 303, Diocletian issues an edict requiring that all Christians hand over their scriptures on the pain of imprisonment and death. Their churches will be destroyed and they be banned from, plead, uh, from pleading in the courts. How does he do this? So basically, Diocletian sets up a system in which you have to go and offer persecution, uh, offer incense to the empire and get a chit. This is a similar process that Dacius used. And if you cannot do this, and you can't show your um, sacrifice token when you're called for, you can be executed. This begins a very difficult time. However, um, in 303 or 313, we'll see these things shift with the conversion of Constantine. But these persecutions did much damage to the church. And it could be a contributing factor to the rise of bishops when uh, so many laymen and probably elders were being persecuted and killed. Uh, and so having a strong centralized leadership was helpful to maintain continuity across these times. So there are many persecutions. There's many more things we can go into. But I want us to think about why did this happen? What was the real cause of this? So the charges of persecution were generally that of immorality incest, cannibalism, lack of patriotism, hatred of the human race, and being the causes of disasters. Christians were seen by many of their pagan neighbors as innately immoral. And you might think, why would that be? Why are they being accused of incest, incest for instance, or cannibalism, really? Um, this comes partially from a misunderstanding of Christianity, right? Christians called each other brother and sister. And so the pagans thought that there was something much more untoward going on. Cannibalism, obviously, because of the Lord's Supper, eating of Christ's body and drinking of his blood. Hatred of the human race is more the issue here. Rome really chafed at the exclusive claim of Christ, that only Christ could be the Savior, that we were sinful and needed a Savior. This did not sit well with the Romans, who wanted to accept as many gods as possible. The more gods, the better. So the exclusive claims of Christianity really caused problems. And this lack of patriotism and cause of disaster go together. The Christians refused to sacrifice to the ancient gods of Rome, which the people of Rome thought preserved their security from um, disaster and failure. So when something would go wrong, the Christians would be to blame because they did not offer proper sacrifices or devotion to the gods. So this is Tertullian. He says that if the Tiber reaches the walls, 
if the Nile does not rise to the fields, if the sky does not move, that rain, or the earth does not quake, if there is famine, if there is plague, the cry is at once the Christians to the lions. He puts this forth in his apologetic work. So basically, they were being scapegoated for all the difficulties of ancient Rome. And this is not surprising, because they were not worshipping the gods. This seems, from the Roman perspective, a practical way to deal with this. But probably the other main thing that's really connected to this is a refusal to worship the Roman emperor. So one of the things that held Rome together was unified uh, adoration and rallying around the imperial cause. When you have a small minority that continues to grow, remember after the uh, first great persecution, Christians grow to about 10% of the population. This destabilizes the unity of your people. And Rome is beginning to worry as it's incre uh, feeling pressures from the outside about this disloyal faction which in, within its own lands. And this will cause great trouble. Okay. And remember, Christians weren't restricted to Rome, but also were in Persia, Rome's great enemy. They were in Ethiopia. They were moving beyond the bounds of Rome, and this was making them quite questionable. We'll see, actually, uh, when Rome does allow for Christianity, in some ways aligned with the church in the early 4th century, the Persian Christians will be harmed because now they're seen as a fifth column or a subversive internal agent for the Romans. So this relationship of Christians to secular power is always a rather difficult one. Right, so we've looked at the external pressure of persecution, but let's see in some ways how this was responded to. That brings us to figures called the apologists. So the external pressure was not only that of physical force, but there was also intellectual attacks, both from Judaism and Greco-Roman thinkers. And to this, uh, several early Christian figures rose to the task. These are generally called the apologists. Apologist here is not one who says, I'm sorry. Uh, apologist means one who gives a defense of the faith. Some of the most well-known you will see above are Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and Origen, all of whom wrote extensive works explaining Christianity in the Greco-Roman context, explaining why it was rational, why it did not, why it did, was not laden with internal contradictions, why it makes sense that Christ be, was both God and man. It did so on two fronts, and we're not going to be able to get into this very deeply, but the first was against Judaism, and Justin Martyr was one of the uh, main guys to take up this attack. We've already heard from Justin about the structure of early Christian worship. His dialogue with Trifo uh, digs into this issue between Christians and Judaism. So Justin Martyr was uh, born a Gentile, and he decided he wanted to seek out a philosophical life. So after moving throughout the Roman Empire, he looked into um, the philosophy of the Stoics. He looked into the philosophy of the Epicureans. He looked into Aristotle. He looked into Plato, which he thought was ultimately the way. But he ran into a monk who began to explain the nature of revelation, and that the God that the, uh, that the philosopher sought had actually spoken, and he did not need to be sought through internal contemplation, but could be heard through the scriptures of the Jews. So, in this dialogue with Trifo, we see Justin dialoguing with a Jewish believer and trying to teach him about the nature of his, uh, his own scriptures in some ways. It's, it's a quite interesting work. So he begins by setting forth his own personal testimony, his journey to Christianity after pursuing these various philosophies, which he's come to see as Christ as the truth of in the culmination of the Old Testament. So here you have a Gentile, a philosopher, Justin Martyr, trying to persuade a Jewish believer that the Old Testament actually points to this coming Messiah, that there's the prophets and the law point to this one. This was a standard uh, apologetic tact for the early Christians, going through the different prophecies, trying to show how they pointed to Christ, and they'll be continued um, all the way up through the Middle Ages into the early modern period. So this is one strand that Justin will set forth, this appeal to the Old Testament as giving us the truth of Christ. So it's interesting, the Gentile is coming back to the Jew and saying, your scriptures show forth Christ. Very, very interesting, right? There's another movement going on uh, as Greco-Roman attacks come against the church. So 
The pagan world attacked Christianity from two fronts. We've already seen some of this rumors and misunderstandings, such as incest and cannibalism. But there was also intellectual and philosophical objections, attempting to show that Christians were ignorant and unsophisticated. Often, these Greco-Roman opponents, such as men named Celsus, uh, Galen, and others, uh, Porphyry was a, another one who was an ancient philosopher, argued that Christians can't be trusted. Why is that? Well, just look at them. They're nobodies. They're getting their converts from the lower classes, women and slaves and nobodies. Right? You see Paul dealing with a similar thing in 1 Corinthians. Not many of you are wealthy. Not many of you are wise in the eyes of the world. And so the sophisticated intellectuals of the Greco-Roman period were looking at this Christian rabble and saying, how could you guys have the truth? You are just a mass of random people. What's going on here? So people like Tertullian and Origen and Justin tried to make the case that, in fact, this is showing us the truth of Christianity. That Christianity is not relying merely on human reason, but the wisdom of God. That we can see this truth through the scriptures and their divine teaching. And that many of the philosophical objections brought by the Greco-Roman authors do not hold up. Okay, so they're, in fact, using some of the tools of Greco-Roman philosophy to defend their own case. Origen is particularly good at this in a work called Contra Celsum, or Against Celsus, uh, where he writes against this very learned attack against Christianity, going point by point through ways he's misunderstood the scriptures, ways he's um, misrepresented scriptural teaching. And he uses the rule of faith, in fact, to set forth an apology for the Christian work. Justin will also write apologies to the emperor, trying to argue for why Christians can be good citizens, why they do not need to be feared. Okay. And Tertullian, who was an ancient father in North Africa, wrote defenses about the, the nature of the Trinity. These are all very early, but they sent the foundation for later Christian understandings of their own theology. Um, I'd recommend reading any of these figures or books upon them. What can we say about the persecutions and apologists in a whole? What did they tell us about the early church? Not only did the church have internal struggles and need to come up with ways uh, to cope with it, but these internal struggles were exacerbated by external pressures, that of persecution and the intellectual attacks on the church. However, the church was able to stand up against these through a constant faithfulness, living in light of the truth of God and holding firm to their confession and trusting in the truth of Scripture. The persecutions, as Tertullian would say, the blood of the martyrs became the seeds of the church. Now, that is not always the case. We do need to remember, and we'll talk about later in the course, that sometimes persecutions that have been steady for years, even centuries, have done much damage to the church and even wiped out Christians from various parts of the world. But these short persecutions that, although intense, gave the opportunity for the Christians to show forth the difference with the Greco-Roman world, that they believed so firmly, that they trusted so completely, that they were willing to die rather than curse Christ, rather than give up the truth of his name. And they inspired others to come and see what Christianity was all about. They, so the faithfulness, the good works of these Christians would actually convert their neighbors. We see that back when we think about the stats, right? Um, Christianity took a, took a huge jump after 250, after the first great persecution. And I think it's partially because the faithful witness of the church, dealing with suffering, caring for one another, being dogged and committed to Christ and the faith, no matter what odds, was attractive. It made these people, it made the pagan neighbors say, what do they have? How can they go to their deaths with this courage, with this joy? What's going on there? And then the apologists laid the groundwork for the intellectual foundations that we'll see um, develop in the next time. Um, how, how to articulate the Christian faith in such a way that the intellectual classes would understand it, that the Greco-Roman could make sense of it, that the church itself could try to wrap its head around the glorious truths that are set forth in Scripture. We'll leave it there for the time. Next time we're going to be looking at um, the end of these persecutions with the uh, conversion of the Emperor Constantine in 313 and what effects that has on the church. In some ways, this is what all the church had been hoping for. 
the empire moves from being against it to for it. But this will also cause its own issues. We'll also look at one of the greatest struggles of the early church that comes right on the heels of the conversion of Constantine, and that is the rise of Arianism and the need to clearly articulate how Jesus relates to the Father. We'll pick up these themes next time, and I'll see you then.